I reached out to a buddy who has spent a lot of time in the traditional publishing world. And I said, how are authors handling this? He goes, they're not. And I was like, ooh, <laughs> that's terrifying. I'm super excited to have Alex Hillman here. He wrote The Tiny MBA, but he's also done a million other things that are super relevant. He's got a tremendous amount of data and expertise. And The Tiny MBA in particular, I think is fascinating for us as an example. First off, because it is useful. People recommend it all the time. And what's amazing about it is how tiny it actually is. Like people say, is it too long? Is it too short? And I go, it doesn't matter. You're asking the wrong question. Is it doing its job, right? Words don't have inherent value. The job the words are doing is where the value is. What was your, your process for making this? How did you come up with these hundred pieces of advice? Where did the book come from? Well, like, like all of you, I have struggled to write a book <laughs> in the past. The Tiny MBA, perhaps most strangely and surprisingly, didn't start as a book. There was no intent to write a book, which I think might have been one of the most freeing decisions. It started on Twitter, my favorite place to be. Basically turned a tweet into a game and said, if you interact with this first tweet, like it, uh, I will post in the replies of, to the tweet a thread that includes one idea, strong opinion uh, about a topic that I know a lot about. And I was like, I want to do this about business, but not just business, but thinking about business from a long view. Um, and I've got at least a hundred of those. So let's, let's give this a shot. And the development of these tweet sized ideas forced me to take potentially big wandering ideas, something that might fill up an entire essay. I had 280 characters to say what I wanted to say, which really forced me to think about how do I be clear? How do I be specific? Or in some cases, how do I ask a question instead of give an answer? And as the tweets started to unfold, I'd realize, okay, this idea that it comes to my mind when I think about long-term business development uh, and business building is actually a bunch of ideas. So let me break them down. And now I've got, you know, one idea is actually 10 tweets, 12 tweets, whatever it is. And it's sort of forcing me to pull apart ideas into their, their most distilled elements. And then the last piece that was interesting, unique, and super powerful, and the complete opposite of how books are typically written, is I was doing this in public with on a tool that specifically invites immediate feedback, possibly rewards immediate feedback, right? So I've got people liking the things that I'm posting, replying to them, retweeting them, quote tweeting them. I've got this immediate feedback loop, not just how it lands, but what people maybe want more of or what needs to be clarified more of. And I get I give this feedback loop that when you think about again, why it's so hard to write, write that like book, it's lots of research, organizing, outline, like so much work happens in a Google doc or something like it with basically nobody else looking at it until you've got beta readers. And I had beta readers watching over my shoulder while I was writing it and going, oh yeah, that. And I could kind of through Twitter almost viscerally start feeling the, the emotional connection to it. The last thing that I noticed that was, uh, that was interesting about this format that is distinctly different from a book is because each of those ideas was kind of self-contained under a bigger theme, I could see people interacting with those individual ideas instead of just the bigger concept. So instead of like beating people over the head with a bigger concept, which I think is often the outcome of a of a, even a good nonfiction book is I've got one good idea and I'm gonna beat that idea into your head for 200 some odd chapters through examples, through instructions and things like that. I could kind of let the theme be emergent and give people these little things to hang on to, little things to like stick in their brain, a quote that makes them go, oh, I never thought about it that way. And if I did a good job, it like, they can't get it out of their head. And then because we're on Twitter, they can share it and share just that one piece. And then somebody else sees that piece and they go, oh, that's interesting. And they go and they revisit the whole thread. So that's a lot about Twitter in context of writing a book. But I think that the, the, the thing that doing this in public so publicly and with such a tight feedback loop gave me the ability to create something where I realized it wasn't that the words themselves were valuable. It was the way people were interacting with the words was how the was how I was watching the value be expressed. People would have a light bulb moment based on, again, 
less than 280 words, a single sentence. I could see which sentences were causing those light bulb moments, which again, even in a, a beta read of a book, it's so hard to see that level of specificity. And I said, okay, it's not just these ideas that are valuable to people, but the ability to interact with them on an individual basis. So fast forward like three months or so after that thread went fairly viral and was still going viral, uh, I, I thought to myself, maybe there's something here. And if we took the lessons from how people interacted with the Twitter thread and thought about packaging it and, and not, not just like marketing, but also like designing an experience around these individual ideas and giving those ideas a place and space in someone's life, in their business journey, in their curiosity of what business really is, this became about, I want to put a book in people's hands and more, I want to have these ideas have a presence in people's lives and a book and how we interact with books seemed like a really great way to do it. I, I love that. And books, one of the unique things is people do treat books differently from any other medium. They don't multitask when they're holding a book. It, totally. it's, it creates exclusive attention, which is so rare right now. Let's talk about Let's talk about pricing and sizing because it's something that you know I've heard lots of people worry about. They go, "Ooh, how many words is too few words?" or "How how much do I have to write?" Y you really ran with that, and you made tininess the core value proposition of the book. And then also, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about the visual design, because if you just written this in normal size twelve Arial or whatever, it would have been about ten pages long. But but you <laughs> added a bit of visual design, and it, it feels booky. Rob, you mentioned my business partner, Amy Hoy with Stacking the Bricks. Amy's husband, Thomas, wrote a very short ebook right around the time that Retina screens, uh, or I should say Apple's branded Retina screens became popular. And the, the developers were making their apps. They needed to Retinify their websites and their apps. And it wasn't a hard thing, but it required a fair bit of research. Thomas had done that research and he wrote a short book called Retinify Me. That was a technical instruction guide on how to retinify your apps. Less than 100 pages, I want to say. And they were, it was priced premium. It was more like priced like an info product in like the $50 range, even though it was short. And people complained about the price. And Thomas went to drop the price to $10 or whatever it was. And Amy said, no, 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 no. We're not going to drop the price. We're going to change the way the product is described on the sales page. And instead of talking about all the things you're going to learn, it's talking about all the time it's going to save you and how you could go and do hours of research, or you can read this book in about 45 minutes and know everything you need to know to properly retinify your book. And 100% of the pricing complaints went away. There is a mental model, both for authors and for buyers, the, the, the value is, is in the words themselves. People say, is it too long? Is it too short? And I go, it doesn't matter. You're asking the wrong question. Is it doing its job, right? Words don't have inherent value. The job the words are doing is where the value is. And when I saw people interact with the tweets, I realized the words, as short as they were, were doing a lot of heavy lifting. And I had a lot of people in the replies going, there's like three tweets in a row that are combined more valuable than the last several business books that I've read and spent way more time reading. And it went all, all kind of all went back to that, that Retinify example. It's a mind blower. You, you put it perfectly. The brevity has to be consistent with the value proposition. If the book's value proposition is that it's saving you time, then it can be very short. And that comes across as a benefit. If the book's value proposition is that it's what, you know, whatever it's entertaining, then it kind of has to be long because people feel like they're paying for entertainment by the hour. Amy's so smart. Like the idea, like, no, 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 we don't need to change the price. We need to change the pitch. Like, mm, perfect. I love that. How many books, even good books, books that you really like, especially in the nonfiction space, do you reread? And so I was like, by this book costing you, you know, less than 20 bucks and between 30 and 40 minutes to read it, I can not just hope that you, I can specifically tell you that if you read this multiple times, if you revisit this multiple times, if you open it to a random page, the odds of that page having something useful to you today or a reflection or a reminder is pretty good. So again, it's kind of, it breaks a lot of the 
tropes and expectations of a book. In fact, the book kind of tells you how to read it, which maybe is also a little bit strange. And the instructions say, read through this once, kind of take your time, but then set a reminder for three months, six months out and plan to invest another 30 to 45 minutes or just open it to a couple of random pages and thumb through and see how those things look and feel different. And I'm basically kind of priming the reader to keep this book nearby. I hear from so many people like I keep it under my computer monitor or it's like on my bookshelf closest to my screen or it's like in my bathroom, which maybe is my favorite. If it's in the bathroom, that's a very intentional choice. Like you're going to flip through it. And like, that's so great. A, a, A physical book, it's singular attention, which is so rare, but it also takes up physical space in someone's life and it lets them be intentional about where it is as a reminder that those ideas exist, which as someone who's created digital products for the majority of my career feels like a superpower it's really really cool and it's been amazing to watch people actually follow those instructions and now that the you know the book has been out for just past six months now and i'm getting emails from people that have said i just did my third read and like that's that's their opening line and i'm like yes it's working the promise that I made in those opening lines of the book of if you come back to this at different points in time, you're, it's going to feel different. They're like, you were right. And I saw something that I completely breezed past last time. And it just so happened to be the thing that I needed to hear today. There's a certain amount of humility in the way you wrote it because you're expecting that people have other things in their lives apart from your book. And I feel like a lot of books seem to assume that the reader has nothing better to do. So I've got a million other questions, but let's open it up a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, about a a bit more about your decision to pull the book from Amazon store. Can you talk a a bit about that, please? Sure. I would love to. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) um, I will say that for anyone who's not super familiar with what's going on, uh, if you Google tiny MBA Amazon, you'll find an article that (laughs) <laughs> to Rob's point about the length of the book, I'm pretty sure the article I wrote is longer than the book itself. I wrote an article about why we made the decision to take the book off of Amazon, but I think there's there's some bigger context that's worth, worth thinking about. So I'm pretty firmly in the camp of Amazon has definitely created a business environment that is unhealthy. I will avoid doing business with Amazon if given the opportunity. I, Definitely as a consumer, especially as a business person. I think as a business person, we have responsibility to be really intentional about who else we're making a part of our business stack. And that in in many ways, that ends up being a reflection of of our business as well. Those choices are not inert. We had avoided um, even being on the Kindle store for previous books in the past, in spite of being asked quite often. The other reason that, that really reinforced that, though, was the knowledge that when you're selling books in particular through Amazon, you aren't actually selling books, you are are earning royalties, right? And the distinction there is the lack of uh, ownership over the customer relationship, which for the business that we've built, the kind of business that we've chosen to run is is a pretty significant value. And that can be looked at through a couple different lenses one of which could be as capitalistic as customer lifetime value, which is true. Uh, you know, someone who buys a book is a potential customer for other things that they could buy from us and an opportunity to interact with that customer over a long period of time to nurture trust and things like that. But there's also an element of research and really knowing who your customer is. And I would say that's a bigger piece to it, that Amazon gives us basically no insight into who's buying. So we, we can't make any educated decisions based on people's buying, which is hard to run our business. The last piece is about customer support. And some people really like the idea of Amazon handling all of their customer support for them. They just don't want to be bothered by it. But we've been supporting all of our own products all along. I don't consider it a significant burden. If anything, it's another touch point to interact with our customers, understand them, understand their pain points. Our products wouldn't be as good as they are if we didn't do our own support. I don't have a support team. It's all us. So I think that that customer relationship is paramount in, in the decision of how we, we run our business. So putting the book on Amazon at all was an intentional choice to kind of go against a bunch of our, our fundamentals and say, okay, I don't want to rely on Amazon for this, but people ask for our books on Kindle. 
let's use this as an opportunity. I'm putting all the work into, into the design of the book, into the production of the book. We know we're going to do an ebook. We know we were going to make it Kindle compatible because we're, it was easy enough to do. Let's learn how this even works. And so I went through all the steps and kind of used it as an experiment and said, maybe I'm wrong about all these things. And maybe this is a great idea. And we learn how this works. And that was kind of the thinking. So we did all that. I think the, the, thing to know about Amazon is Amazon doesn't magically promote your book. Amazon is a magnifier. They're an amplifier of sales activity. And so we had to bring our existing audience and sales, you know, energy. We had to launch the book to our own audience. And when the people who choose to buy an Amazon buy an Amazon that triggers Amazon's algorithms, we shoot up a flag to any other curatorial staff, all those kinds of things. And all of a sudden we start climbing the ranks and that's where the Amazon flywheel starts kicking in. And it worked. We, in the, the first couple weeks of pre-sales, so we did a pre-sale on the Kindle uh, on everything, but including the Kindle, um, we sold 400, 450 copies, something like that. I didn't know what to expect, but I was, I was pleased. And then it was launch day. And that morning I woke up, it also happened to be my birthday. Um, Cause what better way to celebrate a birthday during a pandemic than release a book. So I wake up on birthday morning. I did a live stream on Twitch, checking sales, books are going out. I'm seeing pictures posted to Twitter, people getting the book, everything's cool. I'm birthday, you know, smooth sailing, everything's great. And then I get the first picture of somebody posts a, a, a picture of their Kindle Paperwhite with an error message that says, Tiny MBA is not available for your device. And they go, this is the first time I ever bought a Kindle book that wasn't available for my device. My device is a Kindle, like it's Amazon's most popular. What's going on here? Something broken. And I was like, okay, weird day for Amazon to have a bug, but something's going to go wrong. I'm not upset about it. And then I saw it happen a bunch and I was like, okay, something's wrong here. And we did a little bit of digging and, and found out that, and I won't go into the technical details of it, but I had basically prepared the book incorrectly without knowing it. And I made a choice in how I uploaded the files to Amazon for digital distribution that there was no warning along the way to tell me, hey, if you do this, this won't work on the majority of our devices. Like, A, how do you make that even an option? And B, if you do big flashing red light warning, hey, you might not wanna do this, right? Worse, it was a irreversible change. And so I get on the phone with Amazon and I'm like, hi, I have a problem. And uh, the person that I spoke to was very nice and very unhelpful. And I was like, well, you're basically telling me is a bunch of people bought my book through your platform. Something is wrong. And you're not only giving me no recourse to make it better. You're telling me that the only way that they can make it better is if they decide to reach out to you and get it fixed. And even then the fix was a very clumsy. It was not really a fix. The whole thing was a mess. It's insane. So we realized that there was absolutely the potential to continue that flywheel of sales, but at the cost, at the, at the known cost, of our customers being treated this way. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't, I did not want that to happen. Once you start doing it yourself, obviously this means that you don't have the Amazon flywheel. You're fully reliant on driving your own traffic, your own leads, your own interest, et cetera. You mentioned when we were chatting earlier, the difference between sort of launch sales and enduring sales. Like, how do you approach this? Two things have worked really, really well that I think are replicatable by anybody, regardless of the size of your platform. Um, one of them has been podcasts, which is probably unsurprising, but I've thought about podcasts quite a bit. And we had a show that was moderately popular for stacking the bricks. And the thing that I learned that it wasn't surprised, it wasn't obvious to me before I ran my own show was a, the enduring impact of an episode. So the fact that every, and this is like similar to the tiny MBA itself, every episode is an entry point. And if people really like it, they will go through the rest of it. And so I got to kind of, if I could be somewhere in someone's podcast feed for a relevant audience, 
my odds were not just good for whenever that episode came out, but for as long as their episode exists in the, you know, podcast directories, which is some version of forever. And I was like, okay, so this is an area where the investment of time can be extremely high. The other thing I was thinking about when I was considering the podcast strategy was because the tiny MBA has a hundred individual lessons, I, every podcast interview can be different. It's not go on this podcast and talk about the book. I could tell the podcast host, hey, I've got a book. Here's a copy. It'll only take you 30 minutes to read it or just thumb through it if you want. Let's talk about your audience. Let's talk about you know what they're trying to accomplish, what, what your podcast tries to accomplish for them. I can pick out a few specific lessons that I think will be tailored to you and your audience. You can pick out a few lessons. You can interact with your audience before the episode. Like Every episode can be based around whatever three or four lessons out of a hundred they pick. So every episode's different. And that's worked very, very well for selling enduring sales. I, I, it's tough to like do direct attribution, but I'm basically attributing the vast majority of the non-attributable sales <laughs> to podcasts because the amount of uh, like generalized word of mouth isn't like your book, honestly, Rob. Like your book, it's mentioned all the time, everywhere in response to like, I had this problem with figuring out if my idea is a good idea and people are like you got to read the mom test tiny mba is not quite that kind of book i don't want to say by design but i think it's just a fact and so it's a different kind of word of mouth that we are getting it's more like reader first impressions people are impacted by the book they share that or they share a specific lesson so it's kind of like the tweet thread all over again that's working but there's a lot of sales that i can't attribute to that and i'm, I'm willing to bet the vast majority of them are the the 20 or so podcast interviews that I did between September and December of last year. I, I just want to jump in about podcasts. I, it sounds completely believable to me that they're making that sort of impact. I like, I listened to an incredible interview with uh, Chris Voss who wrote the book, um, Never Split the Difference about negotiation. They sold 2 million books within two years. It was an unbelievable success for nonfiction. And he said the best month they ever had was when they hired an agency to basically put them on the podcast tour. And he, and he said he did like three podcasts per day. And it, he's like, we paid this agency 25 grand and we, we got back 10 times that, you know, yeah. it, it was like an incredible result for him. And he's like, yeah, it's just podcasts. Because he said, if you go to a big conference, how many people do you have in the audience at a big conference? 2000, if you're lucky, if it's really big and, and the right podcast, you can easily get that. And then you can do five of them in a day. Even if we're post COVID, I'm still never going on a physical real world book tour, right? And like, totally agree. I want to have my conversations with readers in person, right? Because you get better learning. But for promotion, mm, I'm, I'm sticking digital. Podcasts are a godsend for this. And something else uh, Gary V talks about a lot is the value of micro influencers who have sort of 1,000 to 10,000 followers in your space because they're not yet able to monetize. And so if you reach out to them and you say, hey, I've got $100, can we do a show about my thing? Speaking of which, actually, you've been doing uh, newsletter promotions. Can you talk about that? I'm really glad you brought that up because that was the first where it placed my mind. Went. Of all of the ad buying I've done in newsletters, only one has actually returned any of the money that I put in, and that was Dense Discovery. If you have a book that is for a creative web entrepreneurial audience or anything in that realm dense discovery is money well spent in my opinion i think their ads are wildly underpriced we've now we just ran our second ad last week and it actually outperformed the first ad which was surprising to both both me and the author of the newsletter are, are you willing to talk numbers there at this time and i'm, I'm pretty sure he's increasing ads ad prices slightly every quarter paid 475 dollars for a spot his list is a little over thirty thousand subscribers we saw like 600 or so unique visitors from that, which is like a decent, you know, slightly over 1% conversion rate on an ad in a newsletter is like, like some people don't get that kind of click rate on their own stuff. Um, so I was impressed with that. And then we saw a phenomenal, like 11 and a half, 12% conversion of visitor to sale at both times. So we forexed our investment in a week. Um, and again, that's in the week, it becomes harder to track those sales over the long view. And then there's also the ripple effect of people see it, people share it, people buy a book as a gift for a friend, all those kinds of things. But an initial seven day impact was a forex of ROI, which I haven't been able to replicate anywhere else. 
The other strategy related to newsletters is more like what you were just describing, Rob, with, with micro-influencers, people who have a relatively small list. I'd say under 1,000 is perfectly fine, typically in like the 500 to 5,000 range, but I know it's a clear audience overlap. And I say, hey, thanks for doing what you do to support your community. I've got a book that I think your audience would love. Here's a free copy so you can check it out if, if you agree. Um, and I'm happy to offer a couple of free paperback copies. So here's the digital version for you, if you like it. I'll offer free printed copies. So the only cost here is my cost to print and, and ship a single book for some sort of giveaway, contest, whatever is valuable to you in terms of interaction and engagement. They get their winners, they send me that information so I can ship off the books to them. But then I also give them a discount code. So when they announce the winners to the rest of their list, everyone who didn't win gets a chance to buy the book for, I offer 20% off as like my standard rate. And these smaller newsletter operators love it. I'm happy to give them complete control over how they decide who the winner is. I can offer best practices based on what I've seen has worked reasonably well. The, the newsletter operator has the incentive to attract, retain, and engage with their audience. I'm giving them the book for free as a tool. It's costing me, if I give two books away, it costs me $16 or something like that, including shipping. So next to nothing, I've not yet to have one where I didn't at least make that many sales from, pe from people buying the discount code or sharing it or whatever it is. I'm happy to do more of the, so long as the audience is aligned, um, I don't really care that it's small. I care that it's the right people. The audience needs to benefit. The newsletter operator needs to benefit. And then I get to come along for the ride. Years ago, I, w I went to this kind of journalist dinner brouhaha thing. And the the only observation or thought that stuck with me from, from all the speakers was someone said, you know, journalists are consumers of stories. And the same is true of a podcast host or a newsletter writer or whoever that's their business. They, they buy stories and, you know, often they buy it with their time or their exposure or whatever, but if you can give them something interesting and valuable for their audience, that's a win-win. You're not begging. You're not asking for a favor. You're actually providing value and it completely flips the equation. If yep. you've got something interesting to share that's valuable for a podcast audience, they want you there, you know? A right. And once you've done it once, uh, April mentioned this on her talk. She said that once she started going on these shows, suddenly there was more demand for her than she could handle because they realized that she had something worthwhile to say for their audience. And to me that like always the first one is the hardest. This is true for conference talks, for podcast appearances, for anything. The first one's the hardest. If you yep. do a good job with the first one, it keeps going. I, I love that. So does anyone else have any questions? I'll shut up for a second and give you an opportunity. I had a quick question. Was there any resistance from people who were helping to publish it or any of that? to the size and the so, strategy. So so thankfully, uh, I didn't have to convince anybody. That's one of the beauties yeah. of self-publishing. I, I imagine that that would have been the case uh, unless I was working with some somebody very boutique. But the only person that I, I had as a, as a fellow decision maker was the designer. So I specifically reached out, reached out to a designer who I had worked with in the past on a, on a print project. She designed and created a zine which is also a very intentionally short, yeah. compact, stylized, written, physical thing. We did it digital as well, but physical um, for an event that I ran last year. And she was a blast to work with and very, very creative problem solver type designer, not just make it pretty, but like, I want to get in there and like solve a problem. So again, same thing about the writing, the design's got to do that too. And so I reached out to her and I was like, hey, I've got this kind of goofy idea to turn a hundred tweets into a book, but I know that I can't just, you know, lay a hundred tweets into a book and call it a day to your point, Rob, like it, not just that it would be short, but I think about it from an experienced design or a learning design, the way the words show on the page is going to inform the way people experience the words and the way people experience the words will inform the way they use the words. So what can we do? There was a lot of back and forth between she and I about how do we do this? Um, and actually, Rob, you mentioned the index at the end. That was one of her ideas that I was actually originally kind of resistant to. I wanted it to be more of a magic eight ball. And she's like, yeah, but there's type A people like me. And I was like, oh, right. The other thing that we, it was more of resisting our own temptation. And I feel like this is a temptation that might have been an outside pressure that we would have caved to in another environment 
was to reorder them. So something that wouldn't be obvious unless you knew it was the tweets, you went back and read the thread. The thread is they're in the order that they came out of my head when I first wrote them. And when sh I was sharing some of the original drafts, it was a, a common piece of feedback was like, I like that there is a kind of wandering narrative, but it maybe it would be cool if these were broken up into sections so I could turn to the section on, you know, marketing or turn to the section on business partnerships. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, maybe you're right about that. Maybe, maybe we should do that. And I actually went so far as to like start organizing them. And I realized A, that was harder than it seemed like it would be. Mm -hmm. And B, it did kind of take some of the steam out of it. It felt like the natural unfolding of the ideas was kind of the experience. And so we actively resisted that, that if I, I could imagine a publisher or a more traditional book designer looking at this and going, it needs to be broken into sections. People expect sections. It needs to be broken into chapters. People expect chapters. And I would have gone, yeah, maybe, okay. Yeah. But the experience was meant to be one where people kind of wandered through it, where they could open up to a page or a cluster of pages and experience them as a distinct thing. And, and pre-chewing it down into sections or chapters felt like it undermined that. So that doesn't specifically answer your question, but I think it I think maybe gives an example of some of the things that I expect. When I think about like what kind of pushback you get, it's, it's yeah. all about tradition. It's like, well, other books are this way, so your book has to be this way. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to advocate for that when somebody else, especially the person holding the purse strings, they want it to go a certain way. So this is one of the reasons why I'm such an advocate for, for ind being an independent creator, owning your platform, is you get to make these decisions. Some of them are risks and not all of them will pay off, yeah. but you know- but the, your the, risk. That you're they're my, they're, you can live with that's them. exactly right yeah the other thing right. i liked about it was the book i've been in business on my own for 15 years most business books are, are written from the point of view of somebody who's starting out and is 25 or who wants to is in a business but they need to scale it and i don't want to do either of those things and so often the examples are you know this is what apple did and i'm like that's completely irrelevant to me <laughs> I know more about Apple's business than I do about my own, I think, and it makes no, it has no bearing on my work. So I really, I just wanted to say, I really enjoyed that, that it's, it's a, I'm able to take those ideas and apply them to my small little business and think about them without feeling that I'm not doing it properly because I'm not scaling or I don't want to be, you know, Jeff Bezos or Steve Jobs in the end. So thank that's, you. That's part of the magic of, of picking the reader profile. Like, I, I feel like Al Alex knows who he's writing for, you know, and it's people like you, Kate, it's like, yeah. you know, that, that's exactly right. And, you know, that certainly shines through on every page. I want to say, A, thank you for saying that. Um, there's a, a, a deep affirmation for me. Uh, there's a very intentional choice to address the person who is not, you know, startup, but also like, it's, it's, it's not that I don't want to grow. It's that the way I gr I'm growing is different from all the growth stories. And so I'm so, so glad that came through. I was wondering if you could riff a little bit on going with your intuition versus like testing and iterating and whatnot. Sure. I think intuition is a powerful thing, but it's also like our gut can be very stupid. <laughs> and so I think it's very hard to tell the difference between your instinct or intuition is just trying to protect you from something versus actually leading you down a, a solid path. And for me, the difference is all about evidence. So I don't even sit down to write something until I know a whole lot about the person that I'm creating for. And so when I know a whole lot, and not just breadth, but depth, I, I know very deeply, I understand the person, I understand their problems, I understand their worldview, I understand what they've tried and what has failed. When I really know and understand all of that, the intuition looks very different because I'm not basing it on my experiences. It, I'm basing it on my observation of their experiences. So that version of my intuition is, is not trying to protect me from myself. Sometimes I still get those things bubbling up, that anxiety, that fear of like, oh, people are gonna hate this. Putting this in the hands of people was super scary. Cause I was like, everyone's gonna be like, Alex, you're a con artist trying to package up a bunch of tweets as a book and sell it for $20. And people are gonna call your shit on it. And I, I that's like, that's the self-protection instinct and it's garbage. It keeps you from doing anything meaningful in this world. The instinct of, I know my readers, 
I know that if people read this, this will impact be impactful. And I know that because I did it once in public and they said that. Like I have way more evidence that it's actually going to do what I want it to do than the back of my mind instinct, which is you're a con artist and everyone hates you, right? That duality is very, very hard to battle. That said, getting the uh, getting the book once it was sort of designed and packaged in the hands of readers before we shipped was really important. With all of that knowledge, with all of that understanding, so I put the book in. You know, I, I reached out. And I said, "Hey, I want to get some some beta readers." Very intentionally, I was like, I, "I put it in the hands of people that I know and trust." But I also put out a call. I was like, I want people who I don't know and don't know me and don't know my body of work to read this. I want your reactions. So the people I know, I was like, hey, do you know someone who you think would like this, but doesn't know me, doesn't know my background, doesn't have a reason to say nice or mean things to me? They're just like, they're going to read it and read it at face value. And I got about 20 of those. And I sent them a copy of the book and I said, here's what I would like uh, in return. Um, I would love notes on any parts that stuck out, stood out to you as resonant. I would love any parts that were, you know, confusing, frustrating, all those kinds of things. I would love to know how you felt while you were reading the book. Highlights and lowlights. How did this book make you feel? What was the experience of reading this book like? And I, got, I heard back from a 15 of the 20 people that I sent a book to, which I think it's important to recognize that not everybody's going to make that time, even though I was like, it's short, 30 minutes, I promise. Um, and most people were like, this is awesome. So good. And there was a handful of people that were like, I was pretty confused when I got to the first page where it was just a couple of sentences. And then I turned the page and it was another couple of sentences. And once I figured out what was going on, I learned a bunch of things, but it wasn't what I expected, which was kind of hard to hear because I was like, well, I don't want somebody to feel negatively while they're reading my book. Um, they weren't telling me I was bad. They weren't telling me that the that lessons were stupid. They consistently were saying that I liked it, but it felt weird. And I was like, okay, that's the, that's the thing we've got to address. This is an, uh, an unusual approach to a book. Um, <laughs> and so I actually, the original introduction was more of the backstory of how the book was written, sort of like the challenge, the tweets and all that stuff. And I realized that for the person who doesn't know me and doesn't know my body of work, they don't care about any of that. That was an introduction to how the book was made. That doesn't help them in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And so three days before we sent the files to the printer for the first batch of pre-orders, I wrote a new intro. And the new intro is the intro that's in the book today, which completely is designed to frame the book as a brain tool mm -hmm. rather than a read through once and if there's something useful for you congratulations which is what people expect of a business book I mean, i'm like i'm gonna take you on a journey it's gonna be weird it's gonna be different from any other business book you've ever read but if you come on this journey with me i'm willing to make you a promise but you got to come on the journey with me and in the way that i intend it to you and for the people who have read that which is the vast majority of them um people have not like i mentioned before done it like they sat down they read it but then they set a reminder and they came back and did it again and people really appreciated that they felt like i had kind of set the table for a meal and i said i made this for you to be experienced in a certain way it is your choice but if you experience it this way i think you're gonna have something of value um and that's not a thing that i would have come up with had we not had that honest bit of feedback in, in those last days before we took it live. Yeah. If there's one lesson that you would like to share from the book, what's the one lesson that you want we can share? I'm gonna share, it's one of my favorites and that is uh, audience building should be called earning trust at scale because that's what it really is. I mean, everything I just said, I think kind of embodies why that's so important. But I think I work with a lot of creative people and there's a lot of um, hubbub about having an audience, building an audience, the value of an audience when launching a product, all of those things are absolutely true. But I think people have a 
kind of broken idea of what an audience is and what an audience relationship is and where an audience comes from and how you build it. And there's not a single right answer to any of that, by the way. But when I think about the value of an audience, or you know, you've, the the title of your 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 work now, Rob, is write useful books. Let's talk about useful audiences. Like you can have a big audience that is not useful at all in the way that you intend it to be. And so in my case, I want to have an audience who I have sort of two, two things. One is I I want a feedback loop because I I care about those people and I want to hear from those people. So in order for the audience to be useful to me, there needs to be some two way dialogue. It's not just me talking at them in sound bites or clips or or whatever it is. Um, and then the other part of it is, is, you know, do I have the ability to help them in a way that is valuable enough that they'll they'll pay for it, right? That is a useful audience in the context of what we're talking about. For other people, that usefulness may look look like it's got other dimensions. Again, no right or wrong, just know what that looks like for you up front. Um, but in terms of the you kind of useful audience that I think is critical for business, that audience has to trust you. You know, I'd rather be able to reach a thousand people who trust me than a million people who like me. People liking me doesn't like doesn't really do a whole lot for me. It maybe feels good in a moment, but people trusting me gives me the ability to make a real impact in their lives and in their work. Um, which means the process of building an audience is all about earning trust. And once you reframe audience building as earning trust, well, now you've got specific things you can do and you can do them repeatedly and you can build systems around them and you can design products that do it for you and, and you can make strategic decisions. You can avoid mistakes. You, and the biggest one being don't do things that break that trust. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's a, that's a through line uh, for me, business and trust are, inextricable and designing a, a business experience as a relationship of trust between you, a seller or creator and a buyer is in, in my opinion, an infinite well of value. And it makes a lot of the scarcity mindset that people bring into business go away entirely. So my, uh, my final question for you, Alex, is there something that you think is, is the crucial mistake that people make when they sit down to write kind of a useful nonfiction book or a profitable info product? Like what's the blunder? What's the trap? What catches people up? I'd say there's two and they're very related to each other, almost like two sides of the exact same coin. The first is not knowing who you're writing for. And this kind of goes back to, to what I mentioned to RJ earlier, like, if you don't know who your audience is at all, then you can't know them deeply, right? So I think people get stuck on a bunch of different audiences that they could serve. And instead of picking one, they pick a hodgepodge of a few. And by speaking to several, they end up resonating less with all of them. I think people's unwillingness to actually get specific about who it's written for is what makes it very difficult to actually be useful for anybody. Part number two is once you know who you're writing it for, picking a, a problem. People get really hung up on trying to pick the right problem. What's the big problem? Is it an expensive problem? There's a bunch of different frameworks for picking the problem. And I don't know which one, one's right or wrong, but I do know that a lot of people get stuck never picking. And it's the same thing as with the audience. That's, that's the common thread between them is when faced with multiple options, you choose none instead of one. And you, you will never go anywhere if you choose none, right? So I always tell our students is like, the only way to get this wrong is to do nothing. <laughs> like you're guaranteeing nothing will happen if you do nothing. I know that sounds obvious, but like, think about what you're doing. You're choosing, like the longer you seek the glass slipper decision that will magically make everything work you delay the ability to see if anything will work at all so make decisions that are relatively reversible that's a lesson in the book as well most businesses business decisions are not entirely permanent make a decision that is cheaper fast to change right and most of them are so do it and do it long enough to see if it actually made any sense at all and do it based on that research and deep understanding. And if not, then 
Try another, try another one. You making a wrong decision doesn't mean you are wrong or you are bad. You don't have to internalize that. But I think because of the way a lot of us, you know, came up through education and home life and stuff like making the wrong decision is punishable by however you were punished. Um, making wrong decisions in business is usually punished by silence, right? Nothing happened. The worst case scenario in most in most decisions, the worst case scenario is nothing happened. And if that's the worst thing that happens to you is that you did something and nothing happens, my goodness, what a dream, <laughs> right? So it's better to make decisions and have nothing happen than never make a decision and nothing happen because you can always keep making decisions and oh, something happened. Oh, I learned something. Oh, oh, that's what I should have done. Oh, oh, that's why that worked, right? And you only get that feedback loop by making decisions and seeing what works. I love it. Amazing. I just want to say thank you so much, Alex. You're a hero. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, Tiny MBA, wonderful book, uh, very inspirational, both as an example of how to write a concise book that delivers a big mm -hmm. punch, dense with words. Uh, Devin and I, and we were talking on, on Twitter the other day, aha moments per word. And I think Tiny <laughs> MBA is one of the highest in that metric of any book I've read. Uh, really wonderful. Thank you so much for coming to share your experience and your wisdom. We're super grateful. Can we all give Alex a, uh, a big clap here? Woo! <laughs> Thanks, everybody. It was uh, great to be here. And uh, good luck to all of you on the useful books that you're writing. And when you ship, let me know. I'd love to give it a read. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me, Rob. Super good to hang out. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. I hope it's the first of many. <laughs> yeah, let's do it again soon. All right. Catch you later, Alex. All right. Peace.